Hello Internet, Seth Skorakowski, and over the past five years, I've reviewed over 75 adventure modules for various role-playing games that I've either personally played or run. I've written modules as well, with Two in Print, A Mother's Love for Call of Cthulhu, and The Hunt for Saber 4 for Traveler, which was printed alongside my updated version of the classic Murder in Arcturus Station. I should probably do a video on that one soon. I've also done other adventures that are on their way, I just can't talk about those yet. I've published five novels, my four-book Valdican series, as well as Ashes of Onyx, which released last year. I've done quite a bit of short stories, including my Black Raven series of shorts, and then various stories that have appeared in uh, various magazines or anthologies over the years. I'm a member of the Sci-Fi Fantasy Writers of America and have presented and participated at various writing conventions around the country. And because of all of that, I regularly receive messages from fans that are asking my advice or tips about writing their own RPG adventures for publication. Now, several publishers out there offer community content programs, such as DM's Guild, Miskatonic Repository, or the Traveler's Aid Society, or some small publishers might use Kickstarter or other means like that to fund their own licensed or independent adventures. So, because there are so many game masters out there that are wanting to try their hand at publishing their own adventures, I figured I should probably offer some you know, tips and personal pitfalls that I've discovered along the way, or just some personal preferences that I have when it comes to pre-printed adventure modules, in order to help those game masters out and hopefully give them a much smoother time trying to publish their adventure. I'd originally planned on doing this, some sort of, you know, top five module mistakes, or, you know, top five or top 20 when you get module sins, you know, pointing out some of the more common and more infuriating mistakes that I've encountered with different adventures that I've read and played. And yes, well, clickbaity videos like that, where they're just focusing on just the negatives, those can be a lot of fun. You know, hate does bring a lot of clicks, but I figure it could be a little bit better than that and offer a, a video that's offering, you know, helpful tips and uh, different advice of different things that authors could do or hopefully avoid. Now, this video is is not geared towards any specific game system. So whether you're wanting to publish something with Dungeons and Dragons or Call of Cthulhu, that doesn't matter for this one. So you will still need to check with those publishers community content programs for a uh, specific layout or content requirements such as uh, what copyrighted game material that you're allowed to use. Also, I'm not going to go over writing the adventure itself or choosing which adventure that you should write. Uh, this is for a game master that already has an adventure in mind but wants to take that next step of writing it for publication for a vast audience of people that they don't know. Now, if you do want tips on writing of the adventure itself, you know, feel free to check out my videos on running mysteries, heists, and horror games. Also, because all adventures are different, my suggestions are not going to apply to all modules equally, uh, so you're definitely going to still have to use your best judgment as far as, you know, which tips to follow and which ones you could probably avoid, just because this is your adventure and I want it to be your adventure. So, long intros and disclaimers finally out of the way, let's get this thing started. The big thing to understand when you're writing a module is that while it certainly contains a lot of the elements that you would find in a story, a module is not a story or a novel that you simply read. It's more like a recipe for game masters, a game master that you do not know, to use and create a story and adventure for their own group, which, once again, you don't know them. Everything that you present in a module should help the Game Master run that game, meaning ease of use and clarity are essential throughout the entire thing. First, let's look at wording. Taking your adventure, which if they're like mine when you write them, is a haphazard collection of notes and incomplete sentences, and transforming all that mess into a coherent written format is a bit trickier than many people might believe. First, use the terminology that the game you're writing for uses. Follow their naming structure. For example, Game Master in Dungeons & Dragons is Dungeon Master. Call of Cthulhu, they call it a Keeper. In Traveler, it's called a Referee. In Call of Cthulhu, you don't say characters or player characters, PCs, heroes, or adventurers. You call them investigators. In Traveler, you simply call them travelers. So check that the game that you're writing and use the terminology that that game uses. Players are the ones that roll dice and they eat chips. 
characters leap across chasms of lava and they fight monsters, so players don't take damage or check a door for traps. Characters the ones that do all of that. Very rarely in your module should you be referring to the players as much as you're referring to the characters. Another trick for phrasing, and this one that I learned from Mike Mason from Chaosium, and I really wish I had learned this one a lot earlier, and now that I've uh, learned it, I can't stop seeing this in a lot of adventures, is try to avert, avoid the word will. So try to word your sentences in a way that you don't use the word will. Matthew Sprange and Mongoose also taught me to avoid the word that as much as you can, because it's often a useless word whenever it appears in a sentence. So when you're writing your adventure, try to avoid these words. For example, when the players open the door, they will discover that everyone inside is dead. Versus, when the investigators open the door, they discover that everyone inside is dead. Better yet, opening the door, the investigators discover everyone inside is dead. See the improvement? Using simple guidelines like this not only helps your work look a lot more professional, uh, giving it an active voice rather than a passive voice, as well as keep your word count lower. That way it's not padded with a bunch of extra words. That way every inch of space on your manuscript is tight and has a lot of meaning to it and isn't just a bunch of fluff. As I said, a module is a recipe, and you need to get a lot of information out very quickly and clearly, but also in a way that's very easy for a game master to reference in-game. Some modules are great for couch reading, where you can leisurely read through it almost like you're reading a book or a story. But the real test is how easy it is to read in-game, when you're frantically flipping pages trying to find that one piece of information that you remember reading that one time, but it's now buried in a wall of text on some random page and you don't remember where that is. Now you're trying to find it while your players are all staring at you because they asked you a question that should have been easy to answer, and now you're like, I don't know where this is in the book. So consider things like bullet points, side boxes, or anything else that makes a quick search easy to accomplish for a game master in-game. One thing that Chaosium does for Call of Cthulhu that I absolutely love, uh, such as in the darkness beneath the hill here, skill mechanics are bolded. So if the PCs need to make a skill check, at a glance down the module page, the keeper can see what skills that they can use here. Remember that your only audience is the Game Master. They're the only ones that are going to read the book. Uh, my podcast partner, John Hook, likes to refer to a module as kind of an intimate discussion where you've got an audience of one, just you and the Game Master, and they're the only one that you're trying to talk to. Now, the Game Master might be a seasoned veteran with 30 years worth of tabletop experience, or they might be completely brand new. This might be their first adventure module they've ever run. Hell, this might be their first game that they've ever run. So right Write the module for that novice and brand new game master. The seasoned veteran, they're fine. You don't need to write it specifically for them. You need to write it for the new game master. That way you can help kind of walk them through it and make this as an easy process as possible in order for them to run this game, have fun, and have all their players have a good time. Never just assume that the game master knows all the game's world lore, especially any world lore that comes from non-core books or different adventures that were published published somewhere else, or uh, blog posts, or magazine articles, or anything like that. For lesser used rules, such as uh, special powers, or abilities, or spells that the bad guys might be using, uh, or obstacles that they might face, such as you know drowning, or burning rules, or something like that, you might consider noting the page number in the core book of where that rule might be found, that way the game master can get to it quickly. Such as, the Baron employs his Bladed Whirlwind Ultra Strike ability. Core book, page 286. A little thing like that could be an absolute lifesaver for a game master in the middle of a game when they read that and they're like, oh my god, I don't remember how that works, I've never used it before. They can see the page number that's in the core book and they can go straight there and they can keep the game running smoothly and they can keep everybody having fun. If your adventure is using some sort of spell or monster or technology or something that's not found in the main core book, first determine if that's 100% necessary that you use that. Can you use something else that does appear in the main core book, or can you make up and introduce a suitable item or class or spell or power instead of using this one that's from a supplement book? A game master reading a module and discovering a totally new spell or new monster, that's a cool treat, because they just found something that nobody's seen before. A game master hates reading a module and on page 23 discovering that they now need to pick up an accessory book just to get the stats for some monster or item description or 
order to play this adventure. For example, when I was writing The Hunt for Saber 4, I was placing some spaceships in it. And one thing that I decided was my mining ship needed to have a laser drill. However, the stats for that particular piece of equipment isn't in the main core book. It appears in a separate source book called High Guard. And while it isn't essential that Game Master have the stats on this in order to do the adventure, it never came up in any of our play tests, did the laser drill become anything that anybody used, I can easily imagine that some group out there might want to use this for a certain part of the adventure and they might want to have the stats on that. But I don't want to force the Game Master to go out and buy this other book out there just to get the stats on this one item in order to play this adventure. So I put the stats for the laser drill inside the adventure module. Now Mongoose gave me permission uh, in order to put the stats from the supplement book in this adventure module and had they said no that they didn't want me to do that uh, then I I wouldn't have used the laser drill because I wouldn't have forced a game master to have to buy the supplement book. Uh, I might have put something else in there. I made up, might have made up a new piece of technology and introduced that in that book. That way game masters could have something new. But if I wasn't allowed to have put those stats in there, I either would have removed it altogether or I would have put up something brand new, a suitable replacement that game masters could find. Now sometimes you do need to use some information from a supplement book or something like that, and that's perfectly fine if you do. There's a lot of adventures out there that might require that. But if an adventure requires that you have a book outside of the main core book, disclose that up front at the very beginning of the module. On page one, just go ahead and list every book or supplement that's required in order to run this adventure. Such as in Mysteries on Arcturus Station, I have on page one that all you need is the Traveler Core Book in order to run this. Better yet, if your adventure does require that they have a specific supplemental books, have that listed somewhere on the back cover or in the description when they go to Drive Through RPG or some other website in order to purchase it. Have it where it's listed right there, somewhere that they can read before they even purchase the adventure. Uh, say something like, "This adventure requires the core book and these supplement books in order to run." Don't let that become some sort of bad surprise prize once they've already purchased the adventure. One of my recurring criticisms that I had for the Mystery of BT SHT365, which was a community content adventure, was how many supplement books were required Game Masters to have in order to play it. And none of those were listed in the very beginning. So you might be on page 20 before you realize that you needed to have a copy of the Central Supply book in order to get the stats on something important for this adventure. Or Highway of Blood, which I haven't had the opportunity to run this one yet, but I do want to. That has spells in it that require having access to the Grand Gromar of Cthulhu Mythos Magic. But that little factoid isn't discovered until you're on page 88 when it's all, surprise, you need to spend X more dollars on the supplement book to play this adventure. So while we're on the subject of the opening portion of the module, let's go ahead and dive deeper into that. The intro information to your module is critically important for game masters. In addition to saying what the adventure is about and what books and supplements are going to be necessary in order to run it and what type of uh, character Characters or levels of characters are best suited for this adventure, the module should give a brief summary of what to expect during the course of this adventure, including the ideal ending. Don't let this all be a surprise to the Game Master as they're reading the adventure, trying to discover halfway through, you know, who the bad guy is or what the final goal of this adventure is. Just go ahead, in the beginning of the module, cut to the chase. This adventure ends with Obi-Wan and Anakin battling it out over a river of lava. Once again, a pre-printed adventure is a recipe, not a novel. Game Masters need to know up front whatever it is that they're cooking. Also, give the Game Master a backstory of events leading up to the start of the adventure. You know, during the game, the players might be asking questions or trying to research the history of something, so list all of the important information as far as the backstory up front for the Game Master to reference and understand when they're initially reading the adventure as well as later presenting this adventure to their group. Some adventures might require a timeline of events, both leading up to the start of the adventure as well as a potential timeline after the hero's begin the thing. Such as, unless the heroes stop it, the eclipse happens on day three, the king is assassinated on day six, and the evil god is reborn on day ten. A simple timeline can be an absolute lifesaver for a game master in order to quickly check mid-game, trying to keep everything straight as uh, far as you know how many more days they have or how many more hours they might have till some important event occurs, and it makes it a lot harder for them to forget or miss that if you just put it in a simple timeline. 
If your adventure has a large cast of NPCs, consider a cast list or a dramatis personae in the beginning of the module, giving a quick description of the NPCs, their relation to the adventure, uh, their motivations, or any essential story details about them. Now, this isn't going to be the NPC stats, you know, what their strength and everything like that is, just the information that the game master can grab and go in order to roleplay them the best. I also love the way that Chaosium lays theirs out with a brief summary for each character, uh, followed by a physical description, traits, and possible role-playing hooks for each character. Then, once all the intro, the summary, backstory, dramatis personae, and all that stuff is done, you can finally begin the adventure, which the adventure begins once you introduce the player characters to the story. How the player characters are introduced to the scenario and the hook, that's completely dependent on the adventure itself, because that can be done something, you know, a couple thousand different ways. But one thing that I strongly encourage you to do, because you have no idea of any information about the group of players that are going to be playing your adventure, uh, as far as you know, how many there are, or what all it is they like, or what their characters are like, consider making the hook flexible. For example, in the Call of Cthulhu scenario Cold Warning, it first gives the year that this occurs as being fluid, so keepers can work this into their own campaign a whole lot easier. Then it offers three very different hooks to introduce the player characters to the adventure. Not only does giving the Game Master an assortment of choices on how to incorporate this adventure into their campaign make it a lot easier for them to incorporate it in their campaign, meaning you might have more people actually play your adventure because it's a lot easier to work in, but it also serves as a friendly reminder that, uh, that it's kind of a prompt encouraging them that they're allowed to change or modify the adventure module however it's best for their own group, essentially changing the recipe. Once again, because you are writing this for the newer Game Master, that's kind of your ideal audience that you're writing it for. That's kind of a quick reminder that yes, the author is giving them permission to change this in order to make this better for their own personal group. Not only that, but during the course of the adventure, you might also offer some you know, side suggestions or alternative means to impart information or clues. Little tips, you know, depending on how the Game Master's game is playing out that they might be able to use. Such as, if the players miss or forget the hint that sends them to the old well, this other character can mention that information or give them this other information or alternate clues in order to keep the game flowing. Now, one thing that I loved in the Two-Headed Serpent campaign was periodically throughout the book they had these little sidebars of weird or interesting things that happened during playtest. I found these to be inspiring for cool ideas, but also encouraging because of all the great and unpredictable ways that the game might go off book, and that is totally fine. Sometimes your group just goes off in some random direction that the modular adventure could not possibly have predicted in a million years. And now the Game Masters are sweating bullets because they think that somehow they've screwed up and all is lost and the adventure is ruined. So it really does help to see these little sidebars here, you know, where you can see from the authors of the adventure itself that during playtests, they had all sorts of other crazy ways that this thing went completely off the rails and they still had a great time and it was completely awesome. And you can actually draw a lot of inspiration from those, but also kind of like a, a nice comfort knowing that you're not the only one. One of the things that new adventure writers can wrestle with is when they're running a game or writing a game for their own players, they already know what type of things that those players enjoy or gravitate to or uh, just what some of their more common strategies are and what type of powers and skills and all sorts of information about their characters that they have. So when that game master is writing an adventure for their own group, they're going to be tailoring their adventure. They're going to be writing it for their own specific group. And that's fine. That's what a game master should be writing their games for, is for their specific group that they have and the specific players that they have as far as, you know, kind of knowing them and knowing how they think. But when you're writing an adventure for, you know, a group of strangers because you're publishing this thing, this adventure needs to work for more than just your group. So you can never assume or take for granted what the players are going to do. It's like how I mentioned in my How to Run a Mystery video. Check the adventure for and thens, such as the player characters go to the cantina and then they go to the windmill, which has no real connection to the cantina. You just knew that that's where they were going to go after that. Or sort of a cause and effect is what you need to make sure that each each step of the adventure has. So it should be something more like the player characters go to the town where they're going to discover these clues, including something in the cantina that will then send them off to the windmill. 
Or check it for railroad scenes, like in Madness in London Town, where a clue sends the player characters to a closed wax museum, if it just assumes that the PCs are going to break in through the front door, uh, thereby encountering escalating encounters as they go through this place until they reach the final room. But zero reason is given why they wouldn't just come in through the back door and bypass all of that stuff. The module just assumed a single course of action by the players, giving no real reason for that. Now, it can be difficult for you as the author to see some of those and then moments, especially if you're seeing these as yourself as what you think the most obvious course of action would be, because, you know, if you were playing it, that's obviously what you would do, and it doesn't even occur to you that there might be another way that somebody else out there might want to do it. So the easiest way to check your adventure to make sure it doesn't have any and then moments or any other issues like that is to play test it. Every adventure that you publish should be playtested. It's kind of amazing how many issues reveal themselves during the course of a single playthrough. And if you find several issues that need fixing, uh, there might be a good idea just to go ahead, make those changes, fix them, then grab a completely different group of players and playtest it again to make sure that you fixed everything. Now, the best playtest situation is one where you give the adventure to another game master. Hand them your written adventure, let them run it based off of the words that are written written down and see how well that goes. If they ask you some questions, like something in the adventure might not have been 100% clear to them, go ahead and fix that. Fix anything that they ask questions for clarity about, because if they found anything to be confusing or difficult to understand, you can be guaranteed that some other game master out there is also going to find that confusing or difficult to understand, and that other game master isn't going to have the benefit of an author helpline just to call them up and go, hey, I wasn't really sure what this meant, and ask you some questions. Go ahead and fix that. That way Way, some game master that doesn't have access to you is not going to be confused by it. And real fast, I want to give a quick shout out and huge thank you to Matthew McLeod and the Lurking Fears crew for their help in playtesting mysteries in Arctura Station for me. Uh, their feedback and ideas were extremely valuable in me getting that adventure out. Aside from playtesting, the second place that you're going to find uh, uh, the most mistakes or oversights is during editing. And one thing that I can never stress enough is to get yourself an editor. Many people believe that they can edit themselves, and those people are wrong. There's a few reasons. First, you as the author already know what it is you're trying to say, what ideas you're trying to express in the manuscript to this other game master, so you really aren't the best judge if you're doing a good job expressing those ideas because you already know what those ideas are. You've already got the answer before you've heard the question. But an editor can then point out lots of problem areas to tell you if you're expressing those ideas in a correct way for an audience out there to be able to understand those clearly because you might not be saying things as clearly as you really think you are. Also, and this one kind of sounds a little weird, but this is totally true, you often don't see your own mistakes in a manuscript because you are quite literally blind to them. The human brain is fascinating and weird, and one thing that it does is it edits information that you perceive. So because you know what a sentence means or is supposed to say, it can edit it so at a glance it sees exactly what you think it's supposed to say. It's like those short paragraphs that get forwarded around social media showing how you can still read this terribly misspelled text here and how it gets easier and easier the longer you read it. This is one paragraph. Now blow that up to a 12,000 word manuscript and your eyes already knowing what a sentence is supposed to say can become completely blind to the most obvious of typos or mistakes, so get yourself an editor. And while there certainly are a a lot of freelance editors out there that can do this, and you can shop around and find one that works well for you and has got the best rates, there are two that I want to go ahead and mention to start you off with on that search. First is Matthew Pook from Reviews from Relier. He's been doing this a long time and has an impressive list of work, including several award-winning titles that he's edited. He's also served as my game master, and he is just a great guy, and I highly recommend him. There's also Draconic, who does freelance editing work for RPGs, so you can check him out for his services. Again, I strongly suggest that if you want your adventure to feel professional and to be taken seriously, the cost of getting an editor is completely worth it. 
Now a couple other little things to consider when you're doing your module, such as the subject material. Do you have the rights to the material? Some games allow you to use their material, while other material you might not be allowed to use, such as D&D have different things if you're writing for DMs Guild or through their open gaming license, so just double check if you have the rights to publish certain material. But another spot to be careful for is locations. If you want to use real world locations, you might want to be sure that you're free to use those. Privately owned locations might not be too keen on you uh, uh, setting the face-eating killer there or some sort of horrible monster at their personal property. Public property like the Washington Monument or the sewers of Paris, those are probably fine versus setting your adventure into McDonald's at 5th and Broadway. This is part of why some adventures rename real-world locations, such as the privately owned Winchester Mansion is called the Westchester House in the Westchester House Adventure. Or the very real Biltmore Hotel has been renamed the Milton in Shadows Over Providence. The reason that I mention this is I had a fan asking my thoughts on an adventure that they were wanting to write, and it was set at a very real and very cool plantation house that's got a great history. And you know, as he was talking, I was like, you know what, I really like what this is going, but this is a real world location. It's a privately owned bed and breakfast now, so setting it on that property might be problematic if the owners don't like that. And that conversation was actually what led me to doing this entire video, so it was a pretty good question to begin with, but just be careful when you're trying to choose a location if it is private property. However, using a real location, or just having making up a location that's inspired by, those are completely different things. And if you change the name of a place and make up your own, but include something like, this was inspired by this very real place, that's a very different thing altogether. I'm no lawyer, I can't tell you exactly what is safe and what is not safe, uh, but it's still a good idea to check to see which real-world places are safe to use in a published adventure just to save yourself some potential trouble along the way. But the other big benefit of using a fictitious location or taking a real location and having it be, you know, change its name and kind of grind the serial numbers off of it and have it be an inspired by location is that you get the free reign to make certain changes to floor plans or other little specifics like that in order to make it fit your game better. You're not constrained by the, the, you know, the actual floor plan or the actual specific location of any real place. If you kind of change it up a little bit and say, hey, this was inspired by this real place, but this ain't the actual real place. Next, while well, sections where game masters to read something aloud to the players, that can be really cool, keep read aloud sections pretty short. Like this one in Ravenloft. This thing is seriously long, and it feels about a hundred times longer when you're trying to read this aloud for a table of gamers. Or this epic from the Illsley variant. So read aloud sections should be short enough to hold an easily distracted table's interest, or have them in the module set up in a way so the game master can cut those out and pan those to their players as handouts. Now, speaking of handouts, I personally love handouts. I talk about them all the time on my channel. Uh, some adventures out there provide really cool handouts that look like, you know, handwritten notes, and they might have uh, different stains and smudges or spots that are burned on them, and I absolutely love that. I love the weathered handout look. However, if you are going to provide a hard-to-read note as a handout, please, for the love of Crom, provide a typed transcript for the thing, such as this one from the Lost Expedition. Great handout, but if no one, not even the Game Master, can read it, then it is completely useless. I actually had to write a transcript of this one out for a Game Master who is a viewer, because English wasn't his first language, and the cursive made it even harder for him to decipher, so he asked if I could do a transcript for him, and I got about 98% of it that I was able to transcribe from him. Same thing for this one from The Dare, which I just recently ran last weekend. I love this handout. It looks great, but it is so difficult to read. And if the Game Master can't understand it, then it is a useless handout. So please, please, please provide an easy-to-read Game Master transcript uh, for any handout that's a note that's supposed to be difficult to read. Make sure that you give away that the Game Master is guaranteed to understand what it is that thing is trying to say. 
Next is maps. I love maps. I love pouring over cool maps, be them for continents or cities, buildings or dungeons. Maps are one of the big things that drew me into RPGs in the first place. However, a good map can be difficult for somebody who's wanting to publish their adventure because they lack the artistic ability to really make a good map, or at least something that's up to the quality of map that they like. So they might decide not to provide a map in the adventure and just kind of simply describe the setting and let the game master make up their own map themselves. But if an adventure has an important scene that takes place at some key location, a map might be pretty damn useful in order to run that adventure properly. And a badly drawn map that looks like it was scribbled by a no-skilled amateur is still 100 times better than no map at all. Don't always assume that the game master is just going to easily be able to improvise that location. Uh, just because you know the basic layout of a fish cannery doesn't mean that I have any idea what the layout of a fish cannery should look like, so go ahead and give them some sort of map if an important scene is going to occur at a location. For example, here's the iconic house map from the Call of Cthulhu's The Haunting. This map is not pretty, but it's been the map that's been used in every edition for four decades because it still conveys all the important information that it needs to. Now a game master can then take this map and they can change it up however they like, but they at least start off with the understanding of what the adventure's layout was intended to be, that way they can make an educated a decision with how it is that they want to change that up for themselves. Now one thing that a lot of adventurers do, such as Blackwater Creek, they provide a very pretty map that's got lots of detail and it looks great. However, they then put spoily markings or location tags on it, meaning that a game master is unable to hand this to their players this great looking map without accidentally spoiling the adventure. So consider offering two maps, a game master version with the location markers and a player version. That way the game master can still offer their players a very pretty map without spoiling the adventure. Also, if your map has room numbers on it, include those room numbers in the text of the module. For example, in Panacea, which I also need to get around to reviewing now that I've run it, the rooms are numbered on the map. But then you have to go to this key along the side to know what room that is, and then the adventure text itself only has the room name listed and doesn't have the number. So with that, just list that the staff lounge is room 54. It's pretty simple, but it makes it a lot easier to run when your players say, I want to go to room 7, and now you're searching the map trying to figure out which room is room 7, and then now you're now searching the text of the adventure trying to find the name of that room, and it would have been a lot easier if it just had room 7 next to that room. So any game masters, if you do encounter an adventure that's got that problem, you know, go in before this scenario, write down the you know, room number beside each room on the map. Uh, it's an easy fix, but it shouldn't have to be a necessary fix to do because the module just bothered putting the room numbers in there in the first place. You wouldn't have to do that. Again, everything in a scenario is about ease of use for the game master. So you need to make all your decisions about what would be the easiest for the game master in order to run this game for a group of players. Now, if you're like me and you lack any artistic skills altogether, there are many freelance artists out there and cartographers for hire that you could use for your adventure. For example, John Sumrow, who has done some great work for various adventures out there. I stuck a link below to his page if you want to look up possibly using him for pretty maps or illustrations. He's a great guy, he's a friend, and I do recommend him. Okay, well that's it. Hopefully you found something useful or worth considering when you're looking at publishing your own adventure. Going from writing scenarios for your friends to writing scenarios for publication, that is a pretty big step. And that's a big step that a lot of game masters dream of making someday, so best of luck with your endeavors on that. It can be a lot of work, but it can also be very rewarding. And of course, I know that I missed probably a thousand other little details like that, so definitely check the various online communities out there, the ones that are dedicated to publishing, especially the ones that are dedicated to the various community content programs for uh, whichever one you might be looking to do if you're looking to do something through community content. And because I do have a ton of published game writers that are in my audience, uh, both amateur and big-time professionals. If you do have any tips that I missed, or better yet, for all the tips that I missed, or anything that you might want to elaborate on, please share those in the comments below. You know, there's a lot of people out there that would love to, you know, hear your thoughts and learn from your own experience because they're looking to do that for themselves. And since I already did bring it up in this video, again, I am a novelist. If you do want to support my channel or just in the mood for a story about modern-day monster hunters and their sentient weapons, go ahead and pick up my Valdican series. 
Or if you want a very dark story about sorcerers, drug addiction, revenge, world hopping, and the king in yellow, check out Ashes of Onyx. They're all in print, ebook, and audio. And if you enjoyed them, please leave a rating or review on Amazon or Audible or Goodreads. Those can be a lifeline for authors. Till next time, gamers, you have a great day.